Welcome to the Developer Tribe where we delve into the process and practice of coaches, educators and beyond. Today's episode with International Mental Health Day on Sunday the 10th is timely and is when our guest releases her new book. We talk about developing holistic health and in particular resilience. I hope you enjoy the episode and as always thanks for being here however you got here and with that let's jump in. My guest today is a coach, mentor, and has a passion for well-being and resilience that drew her to the helping professions. Combining her previous journalism skills, she is also now an author, recently completing a book called Connected, The 12 Ways of Well-Being for a Holistically Healthy Life, which will be released this Sunday, October 10th, World Mental Health Day. It's a pleasure to welcome to the pod, Gemma Marjorison. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. What's been going on for you? Just very busy trying to get everything ready for Sunday. We've got a in-person launch event um, as well as it kind of being released online. Um, so there's all sorts of frantic last minute things being done for that. I'm, I'm sure. Where Where is that? Where's the in-person just in case anyone's able to go along? So it's at Ruby Hall Spa and Village in Rear Green um, in Lancashire, and it's open to the public from 1 till 4 p.m., uh, free entry. Um, it's a wellbeing fair as well as a book launch, so people can come, walk around the stalls, hear different speakers, and, of course, purchase the book. Brilliant. Well, look, I think that sounds like a good fit. And I wanted really to start with where you began your career, your training as a journalist before then moving on to coaching and mentoring. Can you tell us about how that came about and the career transition? Yeah, so I studied creative writing um, and English Lit as my undergrad degree and um, decided um, that after I graduated, I was going to do six months around the world. I was going to find myself um, and decide what it was that I was going to do for the rest of my life, um, as you do very naively at 21 years old. So I <laughs> I set off. I had um, a, a sort of an itinerary planned for those six months. I did a month in Canada to start off with. Um, then I landed in New Zealand and the idea was to do New Zealand, uh, Australia, China, and then come back home. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, um, I got off the plane in New Zealand and was like, hey, this is where I am supposed to be. Um, so I cancelled all the rest of my flights. I phoned my parents and I was like... I don't know when I'm coming home um, and I was there for three and a half years and um, that's where I got a job at a newspaper and um, started uh, a career in journalism. Uh, it was a national paper but a very small team. I had a really lovely editor who taught me everything that she knew um, and so I went from kind of in my studies writing um, you know poetry <laughs> to um to to being a journalist and uh you know meeting uh sports people politicians uh activists uh business people um and um you know just really um understanding story in a different way um but loving hearing those personal experiences from people and I think that's where um you know completely unbeknown to me that's where coaching almost started because I was like hey there's something in this this idea of story and, and people's experience and being able to ask the right questions to pull that out of people um so yeah, when I got back to the UK in 2013, I did all sorts of um, jobs, uh, worked in administration for local council, for local police, um, worked in learner support, did a lot of work with apprentices um, and ended up at an engineering company. Uh, working with their apprentices 
and um they kind of gave me the the opportunity to research uh well-being safeguarding resilience in a little bit more depth and i ended up um delivering training around those uh those particular areas and um they designed a role for me as the learner engagement and well-being coordinator. So I got to sort of support um, apprentices and graduates as my, my full-time role. Then in 2019, I started a doctorate in coaching and mentoring um, at Oxford Brooks because I knew the part of the job that I enjoyed the most was the one-to-one -one work with the individuals again kind of bringing some of those old you know journalism skills and characteristics through and I started that course and I was like oh my goodness yes this is what I'm supposed to be doing um and um yeah started to kind of develop a bit of a um a personal niche um within the coaching skills that I was developing and um, went full time in January 2020, really had to put my money where my mouth was in terms of resilience um, and well-being and all of those other things that I've been, you know, banging the drum of for a while. But um, yeah, that's how that kind of um, how that kind of career developed. A very cool journey. And, and I mean, it sounds like there were maybe a couple of times where there were places you arrived at that just felt like the right fit. You know, you spoke of that of, of New Zealand and then later of Oxford and, you know, your doctor. Um, but yeah, the reason I really wanted to speak to you here was, you know, that, that uh, understanding and that, that uh, knowledge that you have around resilience in particular. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we had a previous discussion of, of it before, which I really enjoyed. And sometimes in sport, that as a term gets misinterpreted um, or sometimes lost in other terminology like grit, uh, determination, mental toughness, or a football favorite of bounce back ability. Um, mm -hmm. So look, help us get a real sense of a definition of resilience from your perspective. Yeah. So um yeah, the, the kind of bounce back concept is one that kind of really uh, pushes my buttons, I think, in terms of resilience. Um, for me, the, the ability to bounce back is about recovery. So it is something has happened that we need to recover from. Whereas for me, resilience is how do we potentially stop that thing happening in the first place? How do we work in a preventative space? Um, and it all kind of stems from my own personal experiences. So I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2015 and I absolutely hit rock bottom, probably have been in you know, some of the darkest places that you could imagine going. And coming back from that is, is my recovery journey. That's what I kind of um, talk about it as and reaching a place of personal recovery. But when I look back at that journey, there are skills that I could have developed that would have enabled me to respond to the situations I faced differently, that perhaps would have prevented me from going to that rock bottom place. Does that, does that make sense? No, it, it, it does. And my, my question is going to be then, and look, firstly, you know, thank you for, for offering some of your, your personal experience there. But my, my first question is going to be, okay, well, if, if resilience is something that can be learnt then, which is what, what you're suggesting, mm -hmm. my issue is it sounds a little bit catch-22 that almost you need to experience certain difficulties perhaps in order to then exercise resilience. 
but that you also need to have had that experience to have the ability to be resilient. There feels like there's a catch-22 there. Um, I, I hope not. Um, I'd like to think that the way that... So because I've had those experiences and I've had this kind of understanding of the things that I could have done differently or things that I wish I'd understood, my hope is that by passing those on to other people, that they therefore don't have to experience those things. Um, and I think that's that kind of then highlights the difference between prevention and recovery. I'm not doing this because, um, you know, while I while I do a lot of work in post-traumatic recovery. My, my main goal isn't necessarily in terms of resilience to help you bounce back or to help you recover. The aim is to arm you so that you don't have to go through those things. Okay. Yeah, no, I get it. So talk to us a little bit, I guess, without giving away too much <laughs> of, you know, some of those tools, some of those things that you are uh, I want to say teaching, you know, correct me if you think that's a, a, an incorrect term to use, but teaching others in order to be, I guess, more aware of how to be resilient. Yeah. And it's really interesting. You should say that because self-awareness is one of the big, the, one of the four. Um, so the first is, is self-care, then it's self-awareness, mm. then it's self-acceptance, and then it's self-empowerment. So that's the kind of process that I uh, teach or coach with um, that I am hoping to develop around my own sort of research and, and, and reading as well. Um, because I think if um, we can understand who we are, understand what makes us tick, what our strengths are, what triggers us, um, and understand um, how we can use those um, when we um, hit uh, periods of difficulty or when things come up that kind of shake us a little bit. Once we have that core identity, that core strength to hold on to, um, I think it makes it a lot easier for us to recognise when things are a little bit shaky and do something about it before we reach a point of, well, actually your illness is forcing you to do something about it. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I mean, my own personal experience of something that was very traumatic, my responses to it were very visceral, were very physical. Uh, I mean, in my case, I, I was pretty mute for a while. You know, that was one way in which I was dealing with it. And I, I can't remember having an awareness of what me as myself was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. I was very disconnected from it. Yeah. So, so how, how, do you, how do you support people who are brand new to this kind of concept to start to understand that, to use the phrase from your book, you know, that connectedness between our own understanding of ourselves and actually then how we can manage situations that we need to be resilient in. Yeah, I always come back to self-care. Um, it For me, it's the absolute foundation of everything. If you can understand what what you do to take care of yourself or how you could improve that and start to put some of those things in place it it just gives that kind of um just that basic foundation of of strength and personal knowledge and from that you can start to then unpick some of the rest the rest of it so for example, um, if you um, 
are a very creative person and your um, self-care looks at, um, you know, uh, perhaps it's it's coloring or crocheting and I'm giving those examples because they're the things that work for me and um, then you can start to unpack that with okay so um, creativity is something that you use as part of your your self-care and um, what what strengths come out of that what does it tell you about yourself um oh okay well actually I can think outside the box um I can follow um instructions in terms of a crochet pattern um you know I can come up with new ideas um and and once you have those kind of strengths on the tape strengths on the table it's okay so if I came up with a challenge came up against a challenging situation how might I use those and it all just comes from exploring your your self-care strategies um, and they then sort of open the door to that kind of broader um, uh, discussion um, around your individual resilience sort of makeup um, and this is where um the the connected book um is a bit of a tool because i look at um sort of 12 different areas of well-being and it might be that people go oh yeah those are the ones that i do really well with and those are the ones that either i struggle with or i don't really value very highly um, and again it just helps to to start off those conversations around um, who you are as an individual and what works for you. That sounds excellent. I've, I've, I mean, I look forward to seeing the book and, and I, I guess now my question becomes because it, it, I'm now thinking about the conversations that I have regularly with coaches of this concept of resilience, that the, the main thing as coaches that we want to see from our work with our players and athletes is their ability to be resilient in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing from you that resilience isn't something that perhaps is developed in the moment. It's developed away from that performance. So how do we take those things like you've described as you know, self-care, so things that I might do away from the performance environment? How do you take those? and push them towards when I actually have to perform? So I think it's about learning those skills so that you have a little toolkit with you for those, those moments where you go, oh, okay, I'm facing this situation. What have I got in my bag um, that, that I, can, I can pull out and use here? Is it actually what I need to do in this moment is a little bit of um you know spiritual well-being a little bit of being in the present oh okay what have I learned about uh being in the present okay I'll just do a quick counting down from five breathing exercise just to help to ground me in this moment or is it um you know uh, okay I'm facing a particular situation where coming back to the the creativity element is that actually this this tough situation in this moment requires a little bit of of problem solving okay how can I use my creativity here look at things in a slightly different way come at it slightly out of the box so by arming yourself with those those tools away from that situation where you're in a good state of mind to be able to learn them I don't know about you but if I'm in a in a high panic you know situation trying to take on new skills or new information is practically impossible whereas if I've already got it in in my bag um something that's already already learned um then you can just just roll it out yeah I really like that I think um there there was a situation a long time ago where I was working with a player that would very often have have some problems with the performance environment was a very good footballer in training 
and then couldn't quite transfer that into the game, consistently at least. Mm-hmm. But this particular player was very creative on the ball. And we came to an understanding of, look, when you're struggling like that, you know, try something else, try something different. Yeah. So I really like that, that you, you've, you've spoken about maybe using some creativity there. I mean, that obviously won't work for everyone, but that's not the point here, is it? As, you, as you've said there, it, all of those four that you described start with self. So it's understanding ourselves. And then if we're working with them, doing our best to understand them. So yeah. how, how do you as a coach and a mentor then, if you're working with someone around resilience, How do you help them go through these four things? I literally do them a session at a time. So in my my kind of blocks of coaching, um, I do kind of a 30-minute intro, let's get to know each other. Um, Then the first four weeks are self-care, self-awareness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And then the the last one is, okay, what have we learned? What are we going to take forwards? Um, Having those kind of uh, review discussions. So I I am as blatant as that about the kind of structure that we use. Um, And and it works really well. Obviously, it's very, very personal to the individual in terms of what topics come out within those sections. Um, But um, there's also that structure there for people to feel um, to feel safe with. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds good. So what what kind of uh, what kind of journeys do you take with the the, the client? And because I suppose one of the things that I've ended up discussing a lot with uh, coach developers, particularly when they're working with coaches one to one, is how close do we get to their life? And and I suppose I do mean li- literal physical proximity, but but also just you know emotionally, mentally, how close and how familiar do we become with those their lives? Is there a is there a point at which you realise you're almost too close or too far away? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does make sense. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, boundaries to be aware of as as a coach in any kind of, um, you know, field, whether that's in sport or in mental health or whatever kind of area that you're you're dealing with. I think the most important thing for me in terms of um respecting that boundary and keeping within those boundaries is it's always about moving forwards I think for me when you start um going back into the past you start bringing up some of those old kind of feelings or um situations that's quite dangerous ground to be in um particularly with um, the people that I've worked with who've been through significant trauma. So I think for me, as long as we are continually moving forwards, um, it gets as close as it it needs to. And I think you can judge that individually, um, but you've always got to be um, mindful of where where are we going? What's the end goal here? And for me, ultimately the end goal is for my coachee or my client to reach a point of independence where they can do all this stuff without me um and um that's that's always what we're aiming towards that's interesting almost making yourself obsolete uh, yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that's the genuine aim and so obviously your your role will be slightly different to certainly myself and probably a lot of the people listening in terms of you will be dealing with some really personal topic Mm. um and as you said you know maybe some trauma maybe some some personal issues um that would go way beyond uh my training and uh the people that i work with that being said you know sometimes difficult things can come up are there moments where as a coach as a mentor 
how do you <laughs> I was going to say bracket and that's not quite the right word that you know almost almost put certain things aside that are your own personal thoughts your own transferences how do you notice those perhaps put them aside maybe acknowledge them in order to then really help the individual that you're working with yeah and i think again it's using my own resilience structure of okay this is affecting me perhaps how do i need to take care of myself in this situation how do i need to take care of the other person in this situation um am i aware of how i'm feeling how i'm acting um if things might be different am i sat here and my heart's beating a little bit faster um am i staying present in the conversation um or are my my thoughts starting to wander to you know parts of my own life um so again it's using some of those techniques um to be able to to stay uh, to stay focused and I think one of the things that has helped me the most is having either supervision or peer support um, there have been numerous times where I've come off um, coaching sessions and have um, you know picked up the phone to somebody and said you know this has um you know hit something or triggered something in particular for me um or this is something that I um you know perhaps would just like a second opinion on did I do the right thing in this situation um and just being able to to have that um you know support with other coaches um is is really important not just to make sure that I'm okay but also to make sure that I'm always doing the right thing for my clients and um, just that little bit of almost accountability as well as personal support and um, so for me it's it's been able to recognize um myself what I'm doing am I continuing to be um you know professional and then having that that personal support there as well so important isn't it you know you, you if you're working with people in in supporting their development in any way that actually if you're unwell for whatever reason that it's going to be a lot harder to actually help them uh, and so we, we do have to be cognizant of it is there is there ever a space where you might make that clear to the person that you're working with that I have my own coping mechanisms. I have my own self-care techniques. Uh, at some points, I may need to exercise those. Um, yeah, I can't think of a situation at the moment where it's come up um, where I've had to kind of say that to a client in terms of um, what's come out of the session. Uh, in that moment I think having done this for a while um it's it, it's it's harder to to shock me than I than perhaps first first thought um I, I can actually um you know have been able to deal with uh with things that have sort of come out of the blue but I've um you know there have been moments within coaching sessions where um you know depending on the client and the, the relationship that you have, I can say, well, this has worked for me. Um, what do you think? And using that again, just to start off those conversations. Um, so there are kind of moments in sessions where I'll share parts of my personal story or parts of um, my recovery journey or things that I've, I've learned um, because you know, it's important for them to know that you're a person too. Um, but also, you know, obviously, that's very much dependent on the relationship that you have and making sure that that's going to keep them them safe as well. No, that's, that's an excellent answer. Thank you. And I, I wanted to then move on to 
the self-awareness piece this is something that I'm really interested in uh, again forgive me from a, a sports coaching perspective but it's amazing how often and and I would have to say I'm I was the same in my early parts of my career that I would put myself to the side and go and be coach mm-hmm. and, and I did that for years uh, until you know really realizing that I actually needed to bring myself with me uh, in order to be a more effective coach but then when you're working with people and they maybe haven't had that prompt uh, or support to start that journey of some self-awareness because of course it is a massive journey it's not it's not a destination there's quite often that initial block that we would experience in trying to help someone develop that despite the fact that they may have even come to you for exactly that help how how what are your strategies for starting to you know pick at the surface of that and help the person get to that place themselves because we can't do it for them yeah I always find values is a really good place to start with self-awareness um I think it's one of those where it's not too personal it's not too invasive to kind of talk about the things that are important to you Uh, but actually when you explore somebody's personal values they tell you an awful lot um, about um, you know uh, who you are and why you do what you do and how you ended up where you are because whether we realize it or not our values play a massive role in the kind of jobs that we take and the kind of careers that we pursue, the kind of studies that we do, the people we spend time with, our hobbies and interests. Um, And so you can have quite a a light conversation, I think, about values and how personal values and organisational values interact. Um, But in terms of self-awareness, that can give you an awful lot to work with um okay so how what kind of situations would align to your values what kind of situations wouldn't how would you deal with those um and you know then starting to bring out some of that that deeper personal resilience side um from from having those very kind of um gentle uh, um, initial conversations yeah, I can I can see that working. I was you know, whilst you were speaking, I was thinking about you know, do I know mine? Am I clear on what those are? And and again, that those would change, right? I think that mm. sometimes it became very popular to have a coaching philosophy uh, a year, two years ago. You know, suddenly, at least from my perspective, everyone had to have a coaching philosophy. You had to know exactly what your values and your principles were. And I think that's something that had gone missing in the interpretation of those prompts which i think was needed was that they could change and they Mm. could adapt or they could move you know it was almost presented as if decide what they are and then that's you as a coach for the rest of your career you know it, it it seemed to miss the really important part of saying these may well be your values right now but let's start to work with them and find out whether they definitely are, whether there's any that you just think they are, you know, maybe you're saying them because they are parental influences, societal influences. It might even be, you're telling me that one because you think that's what I want to hear, you know, right. Get that a lot. Um, So again, how do you, if you get a sense that some of the values that someone has put forward to you do you get a sense that nah that that that's not them that doesn't fit i'm guessing that you're not going to say that outright maybe you are but i'm (laughs) guessing you're not going to say that outright so so how do you sort of gently move someone towards an understanding of uh that one maybe isn't quite right yeah so i think i probably have the conversation around evidence 
So if somebody was to look at your life right now, how would that evidence what you say your values are? Um, you know, if, if somebody says that they value family, um, but your actual amount of time willingly spending time with your family is is very small um then then either there's something there that 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 needs to be you know um you know that there's obviously something that 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 doesn't quite match up there um and 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 again it's kind of opening those those conversations but i think um yeah i, I would say the 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 evidence or how is that reflected in your life uh, is probably how I would start to uh, just dig a little deeper with those. Sure, and and becoming more clear on those values, principles, whatever you want to call them, is that something then that that links directly back into this sense of resilience in in the moment? You know, if I'm clearer on who I am why I do the things I do in the way that I do them. Are those things that then you're able to draw on consciously in the moment as you're doing things? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, it's all about building a sense of identity and as I said values play play a huge part in in what we do and and why we do it and even if that's just the the first step in in understanding what our kind of um broader identities are um then again it's a it's um you know, an, an important tool to have. Um, even if you look at it from kind of a um, a job perspective, just as a as an example. Um, you know, I very much value, as I said, creativity, um, personal freedom, independence, all of those kinds of things. Um, and so, when it comes to the self care, making the right decisions about what kind of um, role I want to take. Um, you know, looking at uh, value statements and and visions of um, you know the kind of um, you know companies or organisations to work with. That's that's going to have an impact. In in that uh, process of trying to develop our own identities and then of course we as coaches are supporting that and trying desperately at times not to put our own stuff on that we're only able to do that and consistently be that identity if we are healthy so let's bring that back around to the book and the 12 ways of well-being i obviously don't want you to give away the 12 uh but tell us a little bit more about the book and how that was put together yeah so the idea for the book came of came from looking at um what i call the four spheres of connection so what do i need to have um in order to live a kind of well-rounded healthy life um, I got a lot of people kind of talking to me about well-being as sort of diet and exercise, um, which is which is great. Um, but there are so many other things that influence and impact our well-being as a whole. So there there were sort of these these twelve ways of of well-being, twelve different areas that I kind of thought made up. Um, a, a, a holistically well life and I realized that while I had clients that were coming to me to dis- discuss any of those 12 things while I was able to coach them using kind of questioning and and those kinds of techniques I didn't have 
any in-depth knowledge of each of those 12 areas. I'm not a financial expert. I'm not a, a nutritionist or a personal trainer. And so what I wanted to do was to put together um, something that was a cross between a self-help book and a well-being directory. So something that gave people the tools to make improvements to one area or several areas or all 12 areas of well-being if they wanted to, but also to have um, people that they could reach out to for support who were experts in that particular area, um, if that's what they felt that they needed. So I started to talk to people that I knew within my kind of well-being network and their well-being network and their well-being network. Um, and so the book has 45 contributors um, to it, um, right from, um, you know, as I said, nutritionists, personal trainers, um, right through to artists, writers, musicians. Um, talking about their um, journey, own personal journeys into how they they started uh, doing what they're doing, um, their um, information, advice and guidance around how to improve your well-being in that particular area, but then also allowing them to publish their contact details as well. So if somebody read the financial well-being chapter and said, you know what, actually, I am really struggling with my mortgage or insurance. Um, there's somebody here that, that I can get in touch with to perhaps help me through that. So it was very much a, a collaboration um, in terms of kind of bringing all of that, that knowledge together um, and helping people to, um, to um, make those, those changes uh, to their own well-being. Superb. I mean, it, it must have been tough at times to bring that all together into one publication. So congratulations for, for, for managing to do that. Do, do you think, was there, a, was there a single or a couple of threads that just appeared to emerge consistently, regardless of the particular part of well-being that these people were talking about? Yeah. So. Um the the physical health part of it um very very important um you know as i said the self care very much sort of foundational to well being and resilience um so that came up quite a lot um and also being present came up a lot as well throughout the book um as a as a consistent theme um so being able to just um you know be be grounded in the moment and and understand your experience uh right there um rather than kind of um you know either burying your head in the sand with it and and distracting yourself um or or taking things away um and and having lots of worries and thoughts going on in your head is just allowing yourself to experience um you know whatever's there in front of you whether it's particularly good or particularly bad and uh, and, and being able to manage it yeah well thank you for being present today and giving us as as much of that information as, as you can without obviously giving away too much and <laughs> um you know all the details of of your book will be in the, the descriptions and so on so good luck with the launch i'm sure it will go really well i always ask a question of uh, each of the the people the guests I bring on and that is if you could have an audience with just one person who would you choose Oh, gosh. Um, I would probably say Robin Williams, um, somebody that I had a really great admiration for, um, but somebody who uh, obviously had a had quite a, a tragic um, element to his story, um, and um, I would love to, um, you know, just to kind of. Um, 
dig in a, a little bit as to how he kind of um, managed and the way that he was able to continue to make um, other people smile. Um, I think there'd be, uh, yeah, that, that would probably be mine. Be an interesting conversation for sure. Mm-hmm. Gemma, thank you so much for your time today. If anyone wanted to reach out, what's the best way to do it? Um, so you probably best get in hold of me uh, via email. So it's Gemma with a G, Gemma Louise Coaching at gmail.com. Brilliant. Thanks again. And just leaves me to say welcome to the tribe. Thank you very much. That's it for episode 11 of season three and our thanks to Gemma for joining and giving us insight into her perspectives on holistic health and resilience. As we mentioned in the episode, Gemma is releasing her book on Sunday the 10th, so take a look at the links in the description to this pod for some more details to that publication. And to stay in touch with us, come join us at developertribe.mn.co to journey freely and loyally towards effective coaching and coach development practice. I look forward to seeing and connecting with you there and of course, back with the final episode of this season next week.